And before we start tonight, Elijah House, Possessing Your Vessel is what we call it, is one of pastor's most favorite things. He loved Elijah House, and he was so excited about us doing it for this season. And I know he's up there watching from the great cloud of witnesses. This was one of his passions. It's one of the foundational things that we do in this church. It's part of our DNA. It's part of how you get to or how you get involved in, in different ministries. This is one of the requirements. But besides that, it's that you're embarking on a journey for the next eight or ten weeks, however many weeks it is, into a deep healing. And I used to tell people when they would come in and they had to sign up because they had to pay and everything else when we did it um, at 219. And I would tell them, I personally will give you a money back guarantee if God doesn't show up and change your life. And I never had to give one person their money back because it is life changing if you work it. And sometimes, it, as Jack Frost would say, it hurts so good. And sometimes it'll hurt. But I encourage you to just press in. Just press in. This is one of my most favorite things to do, too, is to teach um, possessing your vessel. It was a, a love of mine and pastors. And we loved it together. And we got to do it together. And I loved when he... You know, he brought me along, and I would always just sit and watch him do it, and then he let me do it, and, oh, it was like the greatest joy. I was so excited that he trusted me with one of his babies. So I just honor him because he brought into this house a, a, a place and a ministry that would bring healing and freedom to so many people. And lives changed. I mean, really changed. This, through Holy Spirit, the teaching of Elijah House changed my life. And if you let it, it will change yours with the power of Holy Spirit. So in honor of pastor, I just, we just need to take a moment of silence. I honor you, Pastor Pete. I honor you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've poured into me and to every person in this church. Thank you for bringing this ministry here. Thank you for how much you loved it. And we will carry it on. We will carry it on in your name, Pastor. We love you. We bless your memory. And we just thank you for being an amazing man of God and for loving us well and for just wanting people to walk in freedom. We just bless your memory in Jesus' name. Okay. And Father, we just welcome your presence. We thank you for the worship team that ushered your presence into this room. We thank you for what you're going to do tonight, God. I pray that Holy Spirit sits alongside each one, God, whether it's the first time they're in this class, the 20th time they're in this class, whether they've taught this class, whether they just sat in it, Father, I ask that you just continue to show them something new, just like you did with me over the last few days as I was preparing. Father, I just thank you for the courage to come back each week. Even when it hurts, even when your heart is getting, the, the onion is getting peeled back. God, I thank you that you're with us, that you're for us, and that freedom is what you want for each one of us to be able to walk into so that we can walk out the destiny and the purpose and the plans that you have for our life, God. We just thank you, Father, 
that you will unveil and uncover and reveal every single thing that needs to be uncovered so that each one of us can move further and deeper in you and walk further and deeper into destiny that you have planned and purpose for each one of us individually, Father. And we just thank you. We thank you for what you're gonna do over this next season of these classes, Father. And we just thank you in advance, in Jesus' name, amen. Put the glasses on. So this is really one of my most favorite things to do. So I said to David, we were talking about it. He said, oh, I think we're gonna, we should do Elijah House. I said, oh, I've been telling, saying we had to do this forever. I said, I'll teach every class. <laughs> That's how much I love it. So I love, there was a, a season where I begged pastor. I'm like, pastor, I have to do more than just when you're not there. So he did part one. And he let me do all of part two. We ran it simultaneously. So the people that had already gone part, through part one came to part two. So that was really fun. Anyway, tonight we're going to talk about performance orientation. Now, I only learned about this in the book. I don't really know anything about it personally. Except that my name was on the poster for it. So the scripture, the main scripture for this um, class is Galatians 3, 1 through 3. And I'm going to read it out of the message. It says, you crazy Galatians, did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened. For it is obviously obvious that you no longer have the crucified Christ in clear focus in your lives. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. Now, let me put this question to you. Did you, did your new life, how did your new life begin, sorry? Was it working your head off to please God? Or was it responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete their own eff by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful process for nothing? Is it not yet a total loss? But certainly it will be if you keep it up. Selah. Galatians 1.10 in the voice says, Do you think I care about the approval of men or about the approval of God? Do you think I am on a mission to please people? If I am still spinning my wheels trying to please people, then there is no way I can be a servant of the anointed one, the liberating king. That's another Selah. Now, I'm going to read something from the book. It says, the constant propensity of the Christian to fall back to striving by human efforts. Our minds and spirits know the free gift of salvation, but our hearts retain their habit to earn love by performing. The internal structure of performance orientation forms an obstinate area of unbelief in the hearts of Christian. So what he's saying there is that we have unsaved areas of our heart when we're in different areas of performance orientation. Now commonly, we who are saved are unaware or bewitched, as it says in Galatians, that other motives than God's love has begun to corrupt our serving into striving, tension, fear, or suspecting if we fail to know which, why, or what wrong motive we have. So I'm going to share a testimony. When I first got saved, I grew up a good Catholic girl, and I loved God, and I went to church all the time, and... I always knew that if I said enough prayers or if I uh, lit candles in church or I remember we prayed, you know, for people to get out of purgatory, whatever, um, 
that I could get to heaven that way, even if I made some mistakes. But then when I got saved and realized that it was a free gift and I could no longer do those things to get to heaven, I got really afraid because it was ingrained in me since I was a little girl. And I started to panic. And I would go to Catholic church and I would go to my, ch my new church and every Sunday. And I would be so panic-stricken that I couldn't earn my way anymore that it sent me into a tailspin to the hospital. It sent me to the psychiatrist to get some Prozac, I think it was. I only did that for a short time. I'm like, this is not for me. <laughs> and I got rid of it. But it was that I didn't realize that I couldn't earn my way to heaven anymore. And I got afraid. And then I realized, you know, after I got in it a little bit more, then I was okay. But it was my wrong motive that I thought I could earn my way to heaven, which is impossible. So in Hebrews 3.12 in the Amplified, it's called the peril of unbelief. And it says, take care, brothers and sisters, that there are not be any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God. Now, with that whole thing, with I thought I could protect myself and I could get myself there. I thought I could do it. And I didn't believe or trust what I was being told that God said, it's a free gift. You just have to accept me as your Lord and Savior. And it caused me a lot of heartache. And I'm so grateful for the people in my life that came alongside of me to help me understand that part. And that, that part of my heart, I didn't need to protect it. I didn't need to do it by myself. I didn't have to have unbelief. I could trust that God said it and it was going to be. Performance orientation is a term that refers to not to the service that we perform, but to the false motives that impel us. After bringing performance orientation to death, you might do exactly the same thing that you did before, but from an entirely different motive. And it's a different intent of your heart. So you're not doing those things now to earn a place or to earn love. You're doing it out of love. And you will do it because you want to, not because you have to. With performance orientation, you have to. In your, in your head, you have to. In this lesson, we're going to explore the roots, the problems, and identify some of the symptoms. So the primary cause for performance orientation is a lack of love and affection and a lack of touch. Now, you don't think that that sounds like a big deal, but for, you're thinking with your big adult mind. Now, you've got to start thinking with your little child mind. And those things are very important to children. And actually, in one of the classes, it's called um, emotional abuse. We're not going to do it. That's part two. But um, that is actually emotional abuse when you have a lack of love, affection, or touch as a child. So performance orientation means that we are oper operating out of a base of fear and insecurity and a fear of rejection. In 1 John 4, 18, in the Amplified, it says, there is no fear, dread does not exist, but perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because Fear involves the expectation of divine punishment so that no one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. In the message, it says, to love, to be loved, God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us, so that we're f 
free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the, the world is identical with Christ's. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not fully formed in love. And performance orientation is all about love. In 2 Timothy 1 through 7, 1 7, I'm sorry, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And in Romans 3, 38 and 39, in the Amplified, it says, For I am convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present or threatening nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth or any created thing, including performance orientation, will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, not any sin that we ever committed, not any sin that we will commit, because when he went to the cross, he already saw every sin you're going to commit until you go home to be with him. And he went to the cross for that. And we sing a little song with our grandchildren. It, it says, I love you best, I love you most, I love you high, I love you low, I love you deep, I love you wide, I love you, I love you, I love you this much. And every one of them can repeat it. And even the three-month-old baby responds to it when she hears it because it's all about the father's love. So in that we are performing to win love that we've already been given. God already gave it to us at the cross. The cross used to be behind us when we were teaching this, but it's up there now. But he already gave it to us. What happens in performance orientation is our hearts get laminated with what ought to be separated. Our heart gets laminated with behaving well and performing and being loved. And you know when something gets laminated together, it's pretty impossible to pull apart. Believe me, I have tried. Because I like those little corners, like on papers, I like to peel. And when you peel it, it just destroys it. So... When things are laminated together in our heart, the power of Holy Spirit and the fire of God can separate them. But they have to be separated. Being loved and performing don't go together. We don't have to perform to be loved. God isn't up there going, perform, be a little monkey, let me use the marionette puppet things to move you around. So I can love you and you'll do it exactly the way I want you to. We do, it the, we do it the way he wants us to because we love him. And we know he loves us. What is performance orientation? Performance orientation is a set. It's not a set of behaviors. It's an attitude. It's an attitude and it is an acceptance of lies about us that is built into us through, from infancy. It's built in and it operates automatically, just like walking and talking. Like you don't have to think about walking or talking unless something's wrong, right? Unless you're in pain or th something like that. You, you, you just do it. You don't think, oh, let me get up and walk. You just get up and walk. Well, it's the same thing with these lies that get built into us. They operate automatically. And they show up in behaviors later in life sometimes. And they're identified as, I don't know if we have that, if you want to put it up, Ray, as you can, called people-pleasing. Nobody's ever done that, right? Workaholism, compulsiveness, self-righteousness, overachieving, in home or work or school, or how about overachieving in church? Shh, don't tell anybody that you ever did that, right? Codependency, never being able to say no. And underachievers, so that others 
expectations are not disappointed. What about perfectionism? I don't really know about that one either, but I think pastor's laughing in heaven. Um, We must be perfect or we won't do it. We're not allowed to make mistakes. And we don't like when other people make mistakes that are in our circle or in our hula hoop either. When we get rid of performance orientation, instead of perfectionism, you can have a spirit of excellence. That's what God wants us to walk in, a spirit of excellence, not perfection. And when we do generational curses with people, when we um, break this, we break performance orientation, that's one of the things we break off is perfectionism because it is deadly. In all these behavior, our security is in what people think about us and doing the right thing. Now, we all want to do the right thing, right? But not the right thing so that people notice that we're doing the right thing. So let's get back to the lies for a second. What are the lies that we believe say? It says, I'm not loved because I ex- only because I exist. I'm only loved if I perform. If I do wrong, I won't be loved. I am only part of the family if I perform the the way that's acceptable to them. So it could be, it doesn't even just have to be your parents. It could be your siblings. So there's, pick up this handout that you got. And I want you to keep it out. And it says, what are your, if I don't, then I won't be loved and accept it. Or in order to be loved, I must. And while we're going through the teaching, if you have those, if the Lord shows you any of these, just write them down. And we are going to pray through it at the end because those are ungodly beliefs that we've believed. And we live our life based on ungodly beliefs. And we judge other people because of our ungodly beliefs. And we want to break those off. So keep that there. And we're going to pray through them at the end. And you don't have to tell anybody what you wrote on the paper. And your neighbor's not going to be cheating to look because they don't want your stuff. I could tell you that. (laughs) This isn't like school where you want the right answer. You don't want the answer of somebody else. So the Lord, I was in um, a worship night a few years ago. And the Lord, they were saying something. And I like literally ran to my seat to write it down. Because the Rebbe was, was bring God, this song or whatever we were singing was bring God your best, bring God your best, bring God your best. And the Lord said to me, bring me your everything. Don't just bring me your best. Bringing me your best just feeds performance orientation, right? Because you only want to bring what's good. But he wants you to bring everything he wants you to bring your hurt, your pain, your ugly, your, your good. He wants you to bring it all to him. He wants you to be able to come with it all. He wants you to bring everything. And guess what? When you bring him everything, he's still going to love you. How about that? He's still going to love you because you know what? I'll let you in on a little secret. Even if you don't bring it to him, he still knows about it. And he still loves you. Amen? And he still loves us. Because he knew when he went to the cross that this day, in this year, Cindy Corman was going to mess up so bad that he was going to pay for it on the cross then because he was going to still love me out there. Bring him everything. And I'm telling you, you want people in your life. It doesn't have to be a lot of people, but you want people in your life that you could bring the good, the bad, the ugly, the hurt, the pain to. 
when you're snotting all over the place and you don't know what else to do with yourself, to say, this is what it feels like right now. This is the lie that I'm believing. This is how it hurts. This is the ugly. You want people in your life that you could go to. And if those people, I hope you, everybody has at least one of those people in your life. If you don't, please get one. And if that person still loves you after all of that, how much more is God going to love us? He loves us no matter what. There's nothing. We read that scripture. There's nothing that can separate us from his love. Nothing. That means nothing. Not anything. Nothing can separate us from his love. Even though the enemy loves to tell us that there is. Wow, that's really bad. That's really bad. He's not going to love you this time. And sometimes we fall into saying, oh, my goodness, like, how do I get back to your grace? Now, sometimes we fall out of grace with God. I'm not saying it's cheap grace. Sometimes we, we do make mistakes, and we have to ask for forgiveness. And sometimes we have consequences for our mistakes, right? But that doesn't mean he doesn't love us because he disciplines us because he loves us. He disciplines because he loves us, just like any good parent would discipline their child. A striving to win acceptance or love, which in any case has already been given. Now, there was one time the Elijah House counselor who um, was so gracious and mentored me and let me sit on, it, on his um, sessions and taught me how, you know, a lot how to do sessions, and one time I was sitting with him, and I, I don't know, something was going crazy in my life, just one of those times, um, and I guess I was feeling like somebody wasn't loving me the way I needed them to love me. I can't even remember what it was, but I do remember what he said to me. He said, Cindy, and he knew the person, I don't remember, he knew the person I was talking about, and he said, Cindy, People love you. He goes, but you can't receive it. He said, it's already been given. He said, you must exhaust the people in your life. And I was like, oh, ouch. But he always said ouches without a sting. He would say the things that were hard to hear, but there was no sting in it. It was just an ouch. But it kind of, it, an ouch that kind of goes to the core of your heart that says, okay, I need to shift. That's love. That's love when we can do that to somebody, for somebody. Doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. What about teaching Sunday school? What about helping friends or neighbors? And we're doing it to earn God's love. Or maybe we're doing it to earn acceptance by the people around us. Once performance orientation is gone, we might still do that, but it'll be for the right motives. Where does performance orientation come from? Prenatal and birth traumas can be a cause, a, a cause of this situation. If a child feels unwanted, so say maybe it's an unplanned pregnancy or a pregnancy out of wedlock and the child feels like, I don't belong, they might feel, because it is proven by science, not just in the Christian world, by science that babies in utero can hear and feel and make judgments, which Easter's going to talk about next week in the womb. So if a baby feels like maybe it's the wrong time and there's no money and the baby feels like they have to earn their place in the family, that's where performance orientation could start in utero. It could be cultural. There are a lot of cultures where high level performance isn't just a nice thing. It is the thing, and you have to live up to a certain standard. And there was a, 
a young woman in our church many, many years ago. And um, the, the standard was pretty high in her family. And she got waitlisted at Harvard. Now, you got to be pretty smart to get waitlisted at Harvard. <laughs> And she basically almost got disowned because she didn't hit the mark. So it can be, performance orientation can be cultural. It could be religious. It could be from school. Teachers can cause performance orientation in, in your, um, your children. Coaches can cause performance orientation. Number three is a lack of affection, laughter in the home. Where there is a lack of affection but huge demands for performing to please the parents at all costs, there's no rest and there is no trust built in those children. Where it's demand, 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 and no fun. There's no laughter, there's no, like, you know, sometimes you got to laugh at your mistakes. I remember, oh, when I used to say to my dad, it, well, in my head, while he was talking to me when I was in grammar school and I did something wrong, um, I would think, oh, just beat me. It would be quicker and faster <laughs> than this conversation. Because <laughs> believe me, there was no laughter in the conversation, it would just go on and on and on and on. And I literally used to think, you know what? A good, just a good whack would hurt for a minute, but it would be over really quickly. But he, he liked to talk to us, which I appreciate it, but not as long as he did. Anyway, because I didn't really want a beating either. I didn't want to get whacked. Um, all right. Another one is conditional love during potty training or any other kind of training. So if you think a baby, you know, messes their diaper or, you know, a little bit, you know, they're getting potty trained, but they have an accident on the floor. You know, I remember one of my grandchildren used to, like, decided that they didn't need to go to the bathroom. They would just take their diaper off and go pee pee on the floor. And, you know, so that kind of a thing could you know, you could get some serious discipline in there for that kind of thing. Instead of, like, laughing and saying, okay, let's just do it different next time or whatever, you know, some kind of reward system. If you went, oh, mommy only, mommy loves you when you do it right, but, you know, I don't love you when you don't do it right. That can cause performance orientation. Because then the kid thinks, I'm only loved if I do it right, and if I don't do it right, I'm bad, and I'm not loved. Unwise discipline sends the wrong message, too. How many of us have ever heard or said, guilty as charged, go to your room until you can act like a good boy or you can act like the, my daughter or my son? That is performance orientation because that means you're only love when you act like I expect you to act, the way I want you to act. Is there an echo? Oh, okay. Where did my nice little boy or girl go? That can't be my little boy or girl. Go to your room until you can act like yourself, and then you could join the rest of the family. That causes performance orientation. What about family values? There's a right way of doing things, and there's a wrong way of doing things. Our family does it this way. If something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Now, those are all good things, but not if they're attached to love. Everything in performance orientation is a reflection on the family. That's how it's looked at from the person who's performance orientated. What about what happens in this house stays in this house? Nobody ever heard that, right? 
Nobody ever heard any of these, I'm sure, not in this class. But all things that build in the child, you're only loved if. There's like something going on out there. Big lights out, right outside the window. <laughs> Does everybody see that? Or is it just me? Is it fire truck? Oh. Fire trucks are following me. I'm telling you, right before I came here, I was like, oh, God, you, the enemy is really after me. It literally almost blew up my house. There, I, hear, I was reading my notes. I hear a pop. I look outside. There's a big tanker outside my window. And there's a fire underneath it. Yeah. And the guy gets out of his truck and runs with a little tiny fire thing and a little tiny <laughs> fire extinguisher and is under the truck trying to put the fire out. And then he runs back to his truck and gets two little bottles of water <laughs> and is throwing the water. I'm on with 911 and I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, protect this guy because this truck can blow up. I ran and got my fire extinguisher that was twice as big as his from my kitchen. And I gave it to him. I go, what's in your truck? He goes, gasoline. Yeah. <laughs> so thank God that got diverted. I called back 911 for the second time. I said, now I'm screaming. It's gasoline and there's a fire. Calm down, lady. It's okay. I'm like, it's not okay. It's going to blow up, and it's going to blow up my house. I ran, I ran to the back of the house. Anyway, position in the family, first, middle, or baby, is competition. It can be competition. It could be comparison in a family. Why, don't, why aren't you more like your brother? Why aren't you as talented as your sister? What about, this is what the Lord showed me today. What about don't be like your sibling? What about that? How does that build performance orientation in another child? Don't be like that one. You don't want to be like that one. And most kids, can kind of, most kids that are pretty sensitive can kind of pick up on, I want to be loved. I'm not going to be like, I don't want to cause any problems. I don't want that. Okay, recognizing the fruit of performance orientation. You don't have your own center of security. They don't have their own, you don't have your own sense of center of security within yourself. Security is in what people think about you and about being a people pleaser. Well, Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Being a people pleaser brings a snare on your life. So we don't really want to do that because you don't need any extra things that you don't want to pick up. Okay, may, um, you may develop a loser attitude in performance orientation. The child works to please, and in the process, they start to lose themselves. They feel like they are fooling people, selling themselves for love. It causes anger, and a lot of the time, the anger is suppressed because they want to be loved. So it, it's like this thing, like they're angry because of what's happening, but then if they show that they're angry, all the things they're doing for the love are going to get blown up by the anger. So they're kind of in a catch-22. Well, I'm not just saying kids. I mean, as adults, we can have that, right? We sell ourselves for love. Ooh, in one part of it, it says we prostitute ourselves for love. I do. No one in the family of a performance oriented person rests. Not only do we measure what we're doing 
but we, everyone else is doing. We measure what everybody's doing because everyone needs to live up to the standard of the performance oriented person. Everybody in the house. Because if they don't look good, guess what happens? What do you think? Then you don't look good. So they have to look good. They have to look good. They have to live up to the standard. Otherwise, it's a reflection on you. And all the work you're doing isn't going to work. You must keep your kids under control so that you look good. You must manipulate and control in your home so that you look good. Oh, you know, what is, um, is it Paul who says, and I am the chief sinner? In one of the versions, he goes from I'm this, then I'm this, and then I'm the chief sinner. Well, this is me. I'm the chief one of these performance orientation in this one. And even performance oriented oh my gosh, performance oriented people need to make God look good. How about that? He's going, yeah, really? I didn't think, I don't think you're doing a good job at that. But yeah, all these things. No rest in the home. That was me, 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 me. And pastor used to teach on the angle scale. And it was like, I think it was like minus 10 to zero and then zero to whatever number. And you would move up on it as you moved along in a process. Now I'm doing a very bad job of describing the angle scale, but you can look it up. Anyway, so now I may be like at a, you know, I'm past the, the, the negative numbers to zero, I'm probably at like maybe like 50 on that. But it takes a while to move that angle scale, like to move it up so that you're not having to control everything in your world. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. When we pray through the generational curse of performance orientation, the main thing that we have people receive is rest. And when I write it on the paper, for some reason, I write it in capital letters every time. Because you could just feel the weight of it. It's so weighty. It's so, it's so much work. There's a need to succeed when you have performance orientation. Performance oriented people often are afraid to try new things because they don't want to fail. Because then they're not going to be loved. Performance oriented people want to know the rules beforehand. The subliminal message there is if I know the rules beforehand, I feel secure. I want to know before I venture out so that I can feel good about myself. Because I know I can do it, then I'll feel good about myself. If, if it's iffy and I might fail at it, then I might lose love, and I'm doing it to perform, to earn love, and then that would be counterproductive if I don't know how to do it, and I fail, and then I'm not loved. There is a huge need for control. It is very big in performance oriented people. And I wrote here, key, it, this is a key, and it's a yikes. Self-control is a virtue for them to the point of idolatry and rigidity. Okay? The Bible says that we are to flee from idolatry and put idolatry to death, not hide behind it. performance oriented people need to be complimented, and then once you compliment them, they can't receive it anyway, and they don't believe it. And then if you tell them the truth, they don't like that either. So the, um, the person usually suppresses their anger. And then they might get to the point where they self-sabotage. Then they have to try and blow up their own deal. Because they want to know if they blow up their own deal, if they're still going to be loved. 
So they do something to blow it up so that they can see, am I going to be loved? Or is the, the, what I think going to really happen and I'm not going to be loved because I made a mistake? They can't receive criticism. They turn it around. They're compulsively defensive. And, um, you know, I, I think I said this in the beginning, or maybe Anna said it last week. You can take this class probably 100 times, and God is still going to show you something new. I've taught this class a gazillion times. I've been in it since 2001, and I was reading through this, and this next one, I'm just going to be vulnerable right now, says, takes responsibility for everything. I've had somebody tell me that. I've had two people tell me that in the last probably year. Cindy, you take responsibility for everything. That's not even your responsibility. But I feel so responsible. And then I'm like, okay, Lord, was I doing it to be loved? And at one point, when I was feeling so responsible, the Lord reminded me, I said, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. I don't care if they don't love me. So God showed me a revelation even yesterday in this. And I, I'm telling you, it's like Anna said, like, you think, oh, I already did that class. No, there's so many layers. And the first time you hear it, you can't possibly absorb everything that is taught in a class. There's times where when people, when we would teach uh, bitter root judgments, people would literally be screaming in the class, not like screaming like Matt, like, oh my gosh, why didn't somebody tell me this a long time ago? I could have been free and I wouldn't have made so many mistakes. I mean, really, people would out loud just like, Loud voices, like not screaming like, you know, what I'm saying, screaming. But, I mean, people, because God's showing you something all the time. If you keep your heart open and say, okay, God, I'm here again, but show me what it is. I mean, I can't tell you. Since 2001, and he showed me, I never even saw that thing before. So I had to pray through it because I don't want to do that. I don't want to take responsibility that's not mine so that I can, because I have performance orientation left in me. You're overwhelmed or over busy. We put people under the demanding performance so it's not free for them to just give. We demand that people perform for us and we don't give them the opportunity to just be and give because they want to. There's a demand there. And sometimes as parents, we can do that to kids. Kids, kids want to help. I feel like kids want to help. Like I just watch my grandkids. They're always like, can I help? Like the little ones, Mimi, can I help do that? Can I help do that? Can I? But if we put demands on them, it takes the ability for them to give away. It, just, um, it robs people of the, the freedom to give. And when it's in leadership, in a church, or in anywhere else, it destroys the spontaneity and joy of giving when it's demanded of you. I'm so glad we live, we, we live in a church and we're part of a family that doesn't do that. It's like so awesome. Performance-orientated people tend to blame others. They're tired, and they're, we talked about it before, they're angry. And it's always, sometimes it's hidden because they don't want you to know they're angry because then you're not going to love them because you're angry. One of the main key signs of performance orientation is that you can minister to others, but you can't be ministered to because you want to hide what's going on inside. You don't want other people to know your stuff, but you're so willing to give out all the time. But that's one of the signs that you have performance orientation because you want to hide what's inside, and you don't want anybody to help you. And if you haven't gotten this book, or I actually like the old book, the blue one, Transforming the Inner Man, better than this. But get it and read it. And some of the classes are online, um, like Paul and John and Paul Sanford. 
they're a little bit rough to listen to, but that's what we, that's what we did. I mean, 19 weeks every Friday, four hours of class, two classes for each, and then group afterwards. We were there for five hours for 19 weeks on Fridays, the best 19 weeks of my life. I cried so hard, but I got so free. All righty. Performance-orientated people usually work hard to love and serve others, but they cannot let other people serve them. What do you think is the result of that? Anger, bitterness, resentment. In Galatians 5.13, it says, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Not perform for one another in love. Serve each other in love. Another thing that performance-orientated people, they can't receive gifts without reciprocating because that puts them in debt. You try to control people and situations. You can't admit what you really feel. You're unable to be truly intimate, and you're very lonely. <clears throat> there is a compulsive need for approval, and the center of every decision is based on what other people think. Dave, could I get a, uh, a bottle of water, please? The general results of performance, orienta performance orientation. Thanks, Joe. I don't usually need that, but thank you. Our fear, striving, chronic fatigue, insecurity, a compulsive need for approval. You know, that's exhausting. Have you ever had anybody in your life that needs a constant pat on the back? They fish for compliments. They're always needing that. It's exhausting. In extreme cases, it causes depression and abusiveness. The inner being finally gives up sending messages until the person feels he really is what he is acting out. Below the level of consciousness, the performance oriented person feels prostituted. He represents, he resents having to sell himself for the reward of love. You become a power keg looking for a match to give him to blow up his own deal. Performance oriented people lose their identity, their true identity, because all they do is perform for other people. And they're not actually just saying, God, who am I? I don't want to perform for that person. I just want to be me. But in all that performing, you start to lose. So um, the Lord showed me, do you remember the movie, uh, The Dark Knight? Keith Ledger was in that movie, and he was the Joker. And he took that role so seriously, he became that, per the Joker. Like, he became part one with that thing. And he ended up committing suicide because of it. That's what we do when we immerse ourselves in the role of performance orientation and what other people think, and we have to perform for what other people think. We lose and kill ourselves, the real self, the true self that God created us to be. And could you imagine? He went to the cross. How much more could he love us? Like, seriously, think about that for a second. We are trying to earn his love. Trying to earn his love that he paid for on the cross. 
Like when I think of that, that must break his heart. Like I sent my son to die for you because I love you that much. And you're still trying to earn your love, my love. You're trying to earn your way by performing for me. When I gave it to you on the cross, that's a wow to me. Guilty as charged. What role have you cast yourself into? What role have other people cast you into in performing for them? It's like wearing a mask, and God wants to rip the mask off. What does your mask look like? You wonder sometimes, like, why people don't, why don't people really know me? Why don't they really see me? Well, they can't see you because all you're doing is performing. And the real you that God created you with a purpose and a destiny can't be seen because all you do is perform. Some of us would win Academy Awards for that. Write down your mask if you have one, and we'll pray that at the end too. This is an ouch. When I read this, every time I read it, I'm like, oh, it's like brand new to me. And it's like performance orientation is a central structure of your kingdom of self. Ouch. Yeah. Performance orientation is the central structure of your kingdom of self. What we're doing when we're in performance orientation is it's for self-protection, right? We're trying to protect ourselves. We're trying to protect ourselves from hurt. We're trying to protect ourselves from pain. We're trying to protect ourselves from being rejected. The only rejected one is the devil. And he just keeps trying to tell us that we're the rejected ones. When he's the rejected one, we're the accepted ones. We're accepted in the beloved. He can never earn that place again. But he likes to project onto us what he is. And unfortunately, so many times we believe it. Whenever we continue in our own stubborn way, the kind, this seemingly unkindness of the Lord is to pile on more and more until we reach the end and become disgusted enough to quit. He overloads the system. Now, he talks about, um, there's a story in here that Paula talks about being the system being overloaded. But I'll tell you what mine was. I had to have everything perfect. I, like, I, when I tell you poster child, literally, I was the poster child for this. Everything had to be perfect. My kids had to be perfect. My husband had to be perfect. My house had to be perfect, as imperfect as it all was. But it had to be as perfect as I could make it. And the more my life felt out of control, the more perfect the things in my life had to be. And <clears throat> I had three little kids. And one of my friends, who's a real, the, the lady who lived two houses away, was my friend and a realtor. She's like, I got to bring somebody to show your house today. I'm like, my house isn't on the market. She goes, well, for the right price, it would be, and I'm going to bring somebody. And she goes, your house is always so neat, it could be shown any time. That was with three kids. Like, literally, Paul would sit up. We, I did this one time. We had company. He sat up, and he had cook, smushed the pillow on the couch, and I started fluffing it behind him. And he, everybody started laughing, just like Joe's laughing at me now. But... I did. I mean, it was just crazy. Like, my kids would go out to play in clothes that you would take them out if you were going out. And then, you know, they would get dirty, and I'd be so upset. I'd have to bring them to the house and change them because they couldn't be dirty because that was a reflection on me if my kids were dirty. They were th four and five years old. You know, boys get dirty. And little girls get dirty, too, you know. And I remember, I was like, oh, they have to look perfect. And I remember buying this pair of pants. I don't know what I was thinking. Now, think, my daughter's 37. So she was probably five years old. So say 30 years ago, right? There were $60 for these pair of pants for her to go out and play. 
I don't know what I was thinking other than they had to look perfect. And then she fell and ripped them like the second time. <laughs> And I knew God was laughing at me, right? It was like, okay. But so this perfect little world, and I had a cover, and my kids like, don't do that. You're going you're gonna to make me, you know, not look good and blah, blah, blah. Until your 19-year-old daughter gets pregnant. And the system is overloaded. And there's no more perf perfect and you don't know what to do with your imperfect world that is now exposed to everybody. Now, thank God we were in an amazing church called King of Kings. And my daughter would say, church got an A plus on loving her through that. They probably loved her better through it than I did. But you know what? To be honest and truthful, it was a relief. I didn't have to be, I didn't have to have this persona of perfect anymore. Because I knew I wasn't perfect. I knew I wasn't. I knew all my flaws. I knew what was going on in my house beside, you know. But it was such a relief. But God overloads the system because he doesn't want you to have to live in that place. All right. And with performance orientation and all structures, such as performance orientations, they carry a reward system with them. So as long as we prefer the reward, will not change. And there are rewards for it. And, in, you know, John goes into, in the book, he was cold and inattentive to Paula, and, you know, he had the little control going on, and... He knew it was like punishing his mom, his controlling mom when she was a kid, when he was a kid. And there was a reward, and he said to God, I don't want to do this sin anymore. But he kept doing it, and God told him, he goes, you're not disgusted with it enough. And when you get disgusted with it enough, you'll give it up, even though the reward is there. So sometimes there's reward system, like, you know, it, you look good when you're in performance orientation, or at least you think you do. I think most people see right through it, but, and performance orientation is very much a kindred spirit to having an orphan spirit, because it's all about love, right? And just listen to the description from Jack Frost about an orphan spirit. The orphan spirit causes one to live life as if he doesn't have a safe, secure place in the Father's heart. He feels he has no place of affirmation, protection, comfort, belonging, or affection. Self-orientated, lonely, and inwardly isolated. He has no one, uh, has no one from whom to draw godly inheritance. Therefore, he has to strive, achieve, compete, and earn everything he gets in life. It easily leads to a life of anxiety, fear, and frustration. Does that not sound like everything we just said about performance orientation? Orphan spirit is when you don't understand the heart of the father and how much he loves you. And if we just go back to the cross, it's all at the cross. How much he loved us is at the cross. If he never does another thing for us, ever, the cross was enough to show how much he loved us. But somehow he lavishes his love on us all the time. Even when we don't deserve it sometimes. There's times where I think, God, I feel so undeserving of your love right now. But he lavishes it on you anyway. It's just amazing. It's amazing. He loves us because he loves us. And Tim watched when I taught it to, uh, uh, in 2019, at 219. Um, and one day I sat, I was sitting on the curb. I think I was watching the kids play or something. And... 
The Lord showed me a daisy, because I love daisies. There's like a happy flower. My favorite flowers are peonies, but uh, daisies are happy flowers. And I started seeing, I love, you know how I loves you, he loves you not, he loves you. Remember how I used to do that when the girls know that. Guys don't really know that, but guys don't sit on the curb going, he loves me, he loves me not. But girls did, right? <clears throat> Even as little girls, we used to say. And um, so I was pulling, like, pulling the pedals and loves me, loves me, loves me, loves me, loves me, loves me, loves me. There was no he loves me not. There's no he loves me not. Because he just loves us with all our flaws, with all our imperfections. And when we have an orphan spirit, it has to hurt his heart. This lady, Alina Moore, says, an orphan spirit is an identity that lives apart from Jesus loving us with his perfect love. Isn't that good? An orphan spirit is an identity that lives apart from Jesus loving us with a perfect love. The biblical the biblical account for performance orientation, as well as an orphan spirit, is Luke 15, 2 through 32. And I'm going to read it out of the New Century Version. It says, while the son was still long way off, his father saw him and felt sorry for his son. So the father ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So his father went out and begged him to come in. But the older son said to his father, I have served you like a slave for many years, and I have always obeyed your commands. But you have never given me even a young goat to have a feast with my friends. But your other son, who wasted all your money all your money on prostitutes comes home, and you kill a fat calf for him. The father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. We celebrate and be happy because your brother was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. But that's a orphan spirit and performance orientation. He performed for his dad. And he felt like a slave. That's that anger part coming in. Like, I performed. I sold myself out for you. I felt like a slave. And now you're giving everything to my brother? And you're doing this for him? That's how God feels when we, you know, we come running home. He doesn't care how dirty we are or what we've squandered. He just loves us. He just loves us. And we got to get a revelation of the Father's love. I'm going to give you some scriptures. I'm not going to read them for the orphan spirit. Romans 8, 14 and 15. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. And John 14, 18. Really, performance orientation just really does come down to understanding of the Father's love. And when you know you're loved... You don't need to perform anymore because when you know the Father loves you, it doesn't matter if Linda thinks this of me or Sam thinks that of me or Anna thinks that. It doesn't matter. When you know the Father loves you and he 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 loves you, and he loves you not ever, you don't really care what other people think anymore. You don't really care that you have to perform anymore to make somebody love you because Abba loves you. And there's um, a, the Father's love letter. I, I put it out there, so please read it. And if you have time, take seven minutes, watch the Father's love letter, go to YouTube, and look for the one that says Brian Dirksen with a father, uh, faithful father attached to it. Make sure you're sitting by yourself. Because the first time I watched it, I was in a room with about 15 people that I didn't know. And I had no idea what I was in for. And I sobbed like a baby. It's so powerful. So watch it. It'll touch your heart. Okay. All right. 
I'm just going to go real quick through these. Healing for performance orientation is you have to hate the structure. You have to hate it. God says, hate what I hate. He hates it. You have to hate it. Help somebody. Physical touch, but make sure it's okay with them before you touch them. Always make sure before you touch somebody that it's okay with them. Even when you're praying with them. We always say, is it okay if I put my hand on your shoulder? Because some people have some problems with that because of things that happened to them when they were kids. Pray to bring the structure to the cross. It has to come to death. Everything in Elijah house has to be put to death. That's John and Paul of Sanford always say, it needs to be put to death. Sometimes we resurrect things that we put to death. But, okay, you want to encourage the person. You want to affirm the right motives. And we want to use God as a barometer in our lives and help somebody in their lives. We can always tell our distance from God by the resurging of striving Control and defensiveness. Okay? So let's look at this form real quick. And if you have anything written on here, we're going to pray through it. Okay? Because they're just ungodly beliefs. So I'm going to pray and you can, you can fill in the blank because I don't know what your blank says, okay? And if you don't have any blanks, that's awesome. You got one better than me, <laughs> okay? So just say, um, you could just repeat after me. You could say it under your breath. You don't have to say your thing out loud if somebody's sitting next to you. But just say, um, Father, I ask you to forgive me for believing the lie that I don't whatever, or whatever the one is that you have, in order to be loved, I must. I forgive every person in my life who helped contribute to forming that ungodly belief and name them. Your mother, your father, your, your coach, whoever it was, a teacher, sibling, I ask you, Father, to forgive me for receiving that lie, for living my life based on it, for any way I've judged other people because of it. I receive your forgiveness, God. I break all agreements with the spirits of darkness and any demons associated with that lie, and I break its power over my life in the name of Jesus, and I choose to receive the godly belief that I am loved with an everlasting love, and that nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. In Jesus' name. And you can just pray through the other ones. And just say, Father, I ask you to forgive me for any way I have become an actor in a a role of performance orientation. I renounce that role. I renounce that false mask that has hidden my true identity and made me lose who you created to be, me to be. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I break a soul tie with that role in the name of Jesus, and I sever its hold over my life in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to, I gave you a whole bunch of handouts. You could just read them on your own. But I want you to stand up, and we're going to read this prayer together. It's a prayer to end striving. And 
and we'll read it together. Reading out loud is not my thing, as you could tell when I was reading the scriptures. So if I mess up, just keep going, okay? Because I got over this one. <laughs> used to be one of my biggest fears to read out loud. So we'll start and we'll say it together. And wherever there's a blank, be specific. You don't have to say it out loud. Say it to yourself. If you want to say it out loud, you can. But don't feel like you have to. But please be specific. And then take this home and just go through it and read through it. Okay, let's start. Lord, I have come to see my performance orientation. I confess to you that although my head believes salvation is by grace, my heart drives me to earn favor, to be good enough, to present myself to others and to you. I admit that I cannot change myself. The fear of not being accepted or loved is so overwhelming it puts me into gear and I begin performing again. When acceptance is given with no strings attached, I cannot receive it. I ask you into my heart to do the work for me and in me. Sorry, I transposed that. Bring my striving to death. I want to rest in your love. Help me remove the hindrance I have erected, which prevents me from entering into your love. Lord, I have been angry with you for putting me in this, to this family, this position. I don't want my anger to keep me from you. So I ask that you restore my heart. I forgive my family. Take a second. I ask your forgiveness for my angry, my angry responses, my fear and insecurity, my impure motives, and for not believing the truth. Lord, I renounce the family lies. I accept my identity as your child. Help me learn how to live that identity in my daily life. Help me to feel, to know within me that success is simply being your child. Help me to be like you, Lord. I ask you to bring to death in me the structures, the habit patterns of performing that I have created. I ask you to minister to the ambivalence in me when I want correction but cannot receive it, or when I want and need compliments, but can't believe them. Likewise, be the Lord of my tongue so that wisdom and kindness permeate the corrections and compliments I give. Help me to take my eyes off my needs and fears. Lord, I resign from managing my universe. I give you my compulsive need to control people and situations. I recognize I have wounded by not affirming their contributions. I have always had to edit, add, or correct. I could always do it better. Forgive me, Lord, for both my insecurity and my arrogance, as well as for the wounds I have caused. Help me to believe that I am not, re that I am not responsible for all that goes on around me. Forgive me for always being a Martha and help me to hear you when you call me to be a Mary. Show me where I have taken on jobs or duties for the wrong reason and give me wisdom to resign when and if necessary. Help me to fall in love with you, Jesus, so that what others think about me is not important. You have said that it is your working in us that enables us first to will and then to act according to your good purposes. I want to be a good workman, but only with your strength and your will. Help me to be like you, Lord. And I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures over you so you could just receive this. In Galatians 2, 20 
through 21 in the message it says, what actually took place in this, I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be a God man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central, nor is my performance orientation. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or you have a good opinion, and I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who loved me, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going back to that. It is not clear to you that to go back to that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God. I refuse to do that. I re reputed God's grace. If a living relationship with God comes from keeping rule, then Christ died unnecessarily. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. And Lord, I just bless everyone here. Come, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. God, I just bless every person here, Lord. Whether it's the first time they've heard it or the 20th time they've heard it, God, that whatever you touched in their heart tonight, God, that you would bring a deep healing, that you would go deep into those places, those lies that were built, even in utero, God, and that your finger would just be put on each one and just and they would be just demolished father that every stronghold again that stands against the knowledge of how much you love us that everything that stands against the knowledge of how much you love us God would be destroyed by the power of the blood that was shed on the cross father and as we look at the cross father when we say to our little ones, our little kids, the little children, how much do you, how much do I love you? And you put your arms out. We put our arms out, God. And we say, we love you this much. Well, God, on the cross, you put your arms out. And you said, I love you this much. And you died so that we could be called your sons and daughters. That we could know that we are loved with an everlasting love, that there's nothing that can separate us from your love, God. There's not one thing that can separate us from your love, God. Not one thing, God. And I ask, Father, that where any anyone in this room struggles with your love, God, that you would just pour in your liquid love, God. Father, pour in your liquid love to the places in their heart that feel empty, that feel abandoned, that feel hurt or pain, God. I ask you, just pour in your liquid love, God. Pour it in until it overflows, God. So that everything, it's just like those little push pops when you're kids and you eat them and you push it up and the stuff comes out. God, push everything that stands against the knowledge of that love out and pour in that liquid love so that when that stick gets pushed, God, the only thing that comes out of us is love. Father, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your unfailing, reckless love for us, God. God, give us a true revelation that we would never again perform to earn it or to please anyone else, God. 
only to please you, Father, because we love you. And I bless your people, God. I bless your people, God, with the revelation of your love in a deeper way than when they came in this room tonight, God. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the cross. And we thank you that you love us this much, God. And just thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.